Me all right? Yeah. All right. So the title of the talk is called Peeling Back the Layers. This is a talk that Benjamin Klimkowski and I put together. Um, and we're presenting it completely in, in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, here's our agenda. We're going to talk through our goals, motivation behind the product, uh, project, a little bit of the methodology. It's not a regular kill chain, which is what we think is the actual contribution of this. Then some examples of the techniques that we put together, uh, insights into the data analysis summary, and then, of course, time for questions. I've got a whole lot of code on little tiny slides, so squint at it, but we've got a lot to go through and a lot of diagrams to show you all. So I won't be able to camp on any one technique for too much time. Obligatory disclaimer, Ben Klinkowski and I both work for the government. Nothing we say in this project represents the views of the government whatsoever, um, so please don't take it that way. <clears throat> Goals with this project. So we wanted to look at, the, at hunting across the kill chain originally, and we wanted to do something that was appropriate for a security onion conference, and we ended up with something a little bit different from, from everything else. So we've, we've noticed this problem when we're hunting across multiple phases of the kill chain, that we don't always have the time and we don't always have the data to hunt on all parts of the kill chain. So our first thought was, okay, we'll just focus on high value parts of the kill chain. C2, XFIL, um, pr privilege escalation, really great places to catch an, uh, a campaign going on across the whole, really great places to watch one spot to catch the whole campaign going on. Uh, but then we ended up, because of our day jobs, skewing towards something a little more, what we call terrain focused or environment focused. and then. We were looking at Jupyter Notebooks and we were increasingly using those in the environments that we were in. So we were like, well, what if instead of just being like, here's Security Onion, like everyone else has done, and it's been really impressive to see some of the talks today on extending Security Onion, using Security Onion, all these things. We're like, what if we just use Jupyter and demonstrate the Bro Analysis Toolkit uh, within it to just use the data science power of Jupyter with Pandas running in it in order to demonstrate a whole analysis concept from the beginning of, of reading in the data analyzing the data and presenting it to the people around us. And then, of course, we wanted to share some cool tools and techniques, which will eventually make the repo private so you guys can go steal all the code. Um, so I'll highlight on here that we are using Jupyter. Uh, we'll go a little bit more into our environment. For those who are unfamiliar with Jupyter, it by default runs Julia, Python, and R in a combination of HTML, markup, and uh, code interpreter so that you can get these really great visuals and commentary all in one with the code that you're actually running. And then there's a feature where you can actually push all of your code into slides, like we've done here, and show them with JavaScript through a web browser. So that's what's going on here. All right, so the who am I? So Ben Klimkowski couldn't be here today. He's a uh, cyber operations officer. He's, you know, big smile, bald head, as you can see in his picture. Uh, he's got a master's in computer science and telecommunications, goes back uh, through Army career, leading teams, teaching at West Point, et cetera. Uh, and then he's you know, Christian, father four, weightlifter, MMA, I don't believe it, he hasn't fought me yet. And then likes to read and you know, research data mining, et cetera. Who am I? No picture, because I'm right in front of you. Uh, I'm what we call an analytic support officer with the Army, which some people call a data science officer and some people call a critical thinking officer. Uh, used to be military intelligence and graduated from West Point. Unfortunately, not when uh, Ben Klimkowski was there teaching. And the reason I say he hasn't fought me yet is I do judo and jiu-jitsu as well. So we'll, one day it'll happen and I'll probably lose. All right. <clears throat> so we have this motivating problem um, that's kind of reminiscent of what we see on a routine basis, which is a firm calls you and your team to do consulting work. The firm is concerned about their security and they suspect that they're being targeted, maybe compromised, maybe not, but they know someone's out to get them. They don't have much understanding of their networks because asset inventories are hard. Um, so are network maps, apparently. And it becomes clear early into the project that you don't have as much information as you want to really clear the network of things going on and to really hunt across it. So you're going to inherently be limited to network data. And in this use case, we're going to limit ourselves to bro defaults because we can get PCAPs, for example, we can run through bro defaults. And this simulates a scenario that we're used to of walking in, dropping a tap somewhere, and having to move from no host logs whatsoever and only network information to finding things of value. So everything we're going to show you in this talk is primarily based on network artifacts. Setting up our environment. All right, so there's a couple things to highlight here. Let me get back over my slides. We're using pandas, but we're using it through modin 
which allows us to do multi-threading with pandas, which increases our processing speed and, and makes our memory use more efficient. And then there's a lot of NumPy use in the background. You can see a whole bunch of other libraries that we use, such as Map and Time, uh, all pretty standard stuff. The other thing to draw attention to here is uh, BAT, which stands for Bro Analysis Toolkit, uh, which is going to super simplify an analyzing Bro logs within a Jupyter or a Python environment. So shout out to Brian Wiley for creating that and for maintaining it. Actually, over the course of our project, he made three major updates um, that kind of forced us to adapt and three major improvements to how it did its memory management, et cetera. Also, shout out to uh, a friend of ours, Jacob Baxter, who's much better at data science than we are and kind of walks us through some of our clustering as well as some of our dimensionality reduction, reduction and projection stuff. And then finally to Mila Parkour from DeepIn and Contagio Malware Dump because that's where we got all of our PCAPs from with the exception of the PCAPs that are from the West Point Cyber Defense Exercise. Next slide, all right. So classes of analytic techniques. For the sake of this talk, an analytic is anything or any analysis technique, analysis technique that allows us to draw insight out of data. That's a really vague definition, but it has a lot of utility when we're looking at a simplified framework like this. So you've got three generic types, aggregation, Summarizing the data, a lot of stacking, doing basic statistics, visualization, enrichment, adding data to it to provide more value, similar to what you just saw Bryant do with the JAW3 stuff, and then processing, transforming it into a more usable form. And then we have learning analytics, where you have regression, clustering, classification. Um, so I want to highlight here the importance of not stepping over the $100 bill to pick up the nickel on the other side. So as you look at this, the simplest are at the top of the page and the hardest are towards the bottom of the page, particularly with learning uh, analytics. And a lot of people are gonna say like, we need to get data science, we need to get machine learning into the fight with cyber defense. And that's true. However, if you're in an environment where you don't understand the basics of statistics or the basics of data science, you're going to pass over a lot of value for very little work in order to get to that machine learning solution that all the marketers have sold to you. All right. So what we ended up coming up with is a terrain-based approach. Unfortunately, it's my only meme in here. It's easier to do memes in PowerPoint. Uh, so instead of walking through each phase of the kill chain like a lot of hunt methodologies will, will pitch, we're gonna start with understanding the data as a whole, then describing what entities are present, how those entities interact with each other, and then finally moving from the terrain focused approach, which is all those entities in your network, into understanding the threats you may encounter and prioritizing your hunt from there. So it's essentially, if I'm gonna go hunt a deer, the first thing I'm gonna do is really, really understand the woods. And then I'm gonna understand all the creatures in the woods and how they tend to interact, and then I'm gonna go after my target, because now I'm familiar enough with the terrain that I can track it even if I'm not intimately familiar with it. For the hunters in the room, like the, the deer hunters, please don't pick that analogy apart too badly. All right, so first step, we're gonna understand our data as a whole. This is all the super simple stuff that we like to do, and we typically throw these up in dashboards, Kibana, et cetera, right? So the first thing we need to understand is actually how much data is, is present. So for this example, we've gone through, pulled out all the IPs that we've observed, uh, deduplicated them and understand them from a source destination IP perspective, for the PCAP I ran this on, we had 31 unique source IPs. Uh, you can see you know, roughly 2,500 destination IPs. And then I demonstrate a set, dice, uh, set difference to figure out what, what's the value of the total number of IPs, which we'll go into the next, whoop, back, down, down. All right, we do the set difference, and we see that those two are the two that, are, those two IPs that are in the set difference of I talked minus I listened, are two people who only talked and never listened in the Brocon log, and that's, that tells it starts to tell us something about the environment. Now, there's more that you can do in this way. Uh, this is just one example of, of how to do that. So we've got basic counts of how much information I have in here. You could also say how, how many megabytes, how many gigabytes uh, does my data take up, how many rows and records do I have, and then start to summarize that into I have, in all of these records, 31 IPs, or I have you know, 2659 IPs, 31 of which uh, were talkers and 2500 of which were listeners, and then cut this down to, with a very simple math calculation, uh, which is one thing minus the other, these two were purely talkers. 
Then we get into describing what they actually do, and this is where we do most of our typical stacking. So here we have TCP, UDP, and ICMP um, stacked up so we can see which ones are most, most common. And then we go into top talkers just like we would do with our dashboards, right? So we can see by session count the top 15 talkers, and that takes as long as okay, sessions are, are interesting, but bytes are more interesting. And so we start to see that this network is very much dominated by, I actually switched over to listeners there, uh, very much dominated by certain, certain people. So yeah, this is top. So we go to top listeners and we're like, oh, okay, so we see that Google's DNS server is the top listener by session count, which makes a lot of sense because UDP sessions are really tiny. So what if we take that out, and, or sorry, what if we switch it over to byte count, does it still remain the same? And it doesn't because the most, most listeners are receiving more information than what goes into a DNS query. So super simple metrics to start to learn about what entities are in your environment. Then we go on to DNS. You can see just by stacking the number of queries, we've got a lot of WPAD. And then request to Google, Google domains, uh, dominate the conversation from there. We'll show you some better DNS analysis techniques soon. So once we've done describing the entities, we start getting into describing how they interact. And this is where the fun stuff actually starts happening. Fun or as much fun as staring at charts on a Saturday can be. All right, so we've got how do entities relate to each other? Are they acting as a server or are they acting as a client? Are they acting as a server when they are a client? And we've got several different approaches to that. So are they hosting well-known or registered ports? What does the producer-consumer ratio look like? And then we can use network analysis techniques like in and out degree to look at that. We can also then characterize those connections looking for dark space on, within the network Internal movement, client to client stuff, we all know that that typically indicates bad. And then connected attempts to block ports. So at this point, we'll switch over to one of the other shows and show you simple filtering endpoints for my backup of this one. Apologies. All right, so now we're going to use the Bro Analysis Toolkit to look for hosts that are responding like servers. Con Analyzer is a library within the Bro Analysis, Analysis Toolkit that allows us to automate common searches across the Bro Con log. Super simple code, read it in, and then I basically spit it out to say, um, describe the data again, and then we can go into show me all of, basically across the top, the ports within the well-known uh, well ports range that people are listening on, and where they were also a receiving host. So we begin to have a somewhat of a fingerprint of what communications went to that host. From here, we're then going to remove certain values and set thresholds, and we end up filtering out for just endpoints that we know are clients and cross, crossing that with the data that we had for things behaving as servers. So two slides back at the contingency table, we have all the things behaving as servers. And then we go forward and say, but we have a list of clients based on what we know is our internal IP space, and we're gonna go through our internal IP space and spit out everything in the server list uh, based on how it was behaving as a server, but we know it's a client, and that begins to tell us some picture of what's going on. For example, this 106066 here, who has served ports up across this entire range from 20 through, through 29, and then we snip it off for the sake of the, of the presentation. You can see that in some other places as well. We can also do this with registered ports. We won't camp on this too long. It's essentially exactly the same thing. Uh, this is just a different port range. And so we start again with how's it behaving as a server and then go through the clients and pull it out. We know you're a client. Why are you behaving as, ser as a server? And what, are you, what kind of server are you pretending to be? We also mentioned producer-consumer ratio. This is a little more math heavy. Producer-consumer ratio is a simple calculation per session that says how many bytes did I send? How many bytes did I receive? And let me turn that into a simple calculation that's going to be between the value of 0 and 1, both positive and negative. So if I only send, if my total bytes is, is created by only bytes sent, i.e. bytes sent plus 0 equals total bytes, then I'm going to be a purely producer at a value of exactly 1.0. If I send nothing, 0, and I receive everything, so minus total bytes sent, over total bytes sent, I'm a purely receiver, uh, purely consumer in this case, so it's download only kind of behavior. You'll see something about for an HTTP download, or sorry, as I'm browsing through the web, 
you should be seeing about a negative 0.5 for regular web browsing activity. If I'm sending an email, you're at about positive 0.5. And then if I'm downloading a big file over HTTP, I'm going to be basically at a pure negative 1. That's how those ratios translate out into real life. So what we then do is for every session in the log, we go through and we calculate PCR. Charts and squint charts. All right, then we're going to go through and actually collapse those down into some de descriptive statistics of that. I want to draw your attention down here to the bottom where it says STD. That is standard deviation. So we're going to, for every IP, yeah, there's a joke in there somewhere, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> for every IP, we're going to look across all of the PCRs for all of its sessions. We're going to collapse it down do the descriptive statistics of it, mean, median, mode, and then we're going to calculate the standard deviation and we're going to present that back to the analysts. We're then also going to figure out max and min values, and then this high calculation that you'll see on the next page is the number of standard deviations that, that its max value is above norm. So the next page you're going to see a max and a high, and the high is going to be in a full number, even though your max is at like 0.3 here. A little confusing, but we can see that for this IP, it's had this many sessions. I won't read it out to you. And then we see it's minimum one. We get it's three quart or four quartiles where they're divided at its max value. And then for this max value, which we can see is above the last quartile from this, that it's five standard deviations above the norm. So somewhere in that IP space, it it was behaving primarily as a most likely as a producer and that was abnormal for that thing's behavior. So we'd go back and look through all of its, uh, its individual sessions and their PCR values, and we'd look for that spike, and we'd begin to find something bad. So that dials us into the, the dot six eight is the one we use for this example, which is one three down. That dials us into what this one is doing. So like I just said, we pull back its sessions, and we begin to drill into it. Uh, this is us running more bad stuff. It produces a lot of warnings. And then we can see the kind of traffic that it's, that it's talking to. And this pushes us straight into, this is actually a merge with the DNS table so that we get real, va real names on top of it. And finally, we land with all of these. So we can see Leno Lenovo uh, with a bunch of nonces down at the, the negative four level, and then a bunch of stuff down here too. And then somewhere in the SNP is sharklasers.net, which is really what we're looking for. In versus out degree, we'll talk about a little bit later. Connections into dark space, uh, for the sake of time, I'm actually going to skip over, and we'll look at internal movement. So client to client communications, this is a very straightforward one. In fact, this slide deck is a total of one slide. Um, this is literally just a filter to say what is internal IP space versus internal IP space. Highlight all the sessions of who they talk to for internal to internal behavior. And then finally, for this section, We have connection attempts to block ports. So if we have a block port list, then we can summarize very quickly each IP that tried to talk to what, what block ports and what was the destination IP and what was the block port. Um, so you're noticing some of this stuff is stuff that we can very easily automate with a seam. And if we're going to do it in an environment like Jupyter, we're just going to go through it real fast, gain some situational awareness, and move on to the next harder problem that a data science or a data analysis toolkit is more suited to solve. Um, and solve only once instead of solving in an automated, repeated fashion. All right. Then we'll come back over to our main presentation now. Characterizing protocols based on, how, on what they do. So this is a little different than just characterizing the protocols. So we all know that HTTP is supposed to write over port 80. So one of the quickest ways we can look for a protocol that's misbehaving is where's HTTP over something besides the four or five ports that are typically associated with that. So, so 80 and then the other reserve ports. We can start to get into things, uh, to outliers based on entropy, which is really better for DNS and HTTP, uh, session length, length of headers, things like inter arrival time, which uh, I don't know if we have the code for that in this presentation. So what we actually begin to find as we dig down into to things like that is DNS has a very interesting profile when it comes to all of these submetrics and HTTP and HTTPS do as well. And based on that profile, we can actually start to describe is this web browsing, is this watching a movie, 
is it's downloading a file, et cetera, without purely relying on byte counts. So we'll walk through outlier detection, which we'll demonstrate actually here. Uh, and then we've got some stuff on measures of entropy and randomness, as well as a couple different interesting ways to look for unregistered HTTP methods and DNS, nonces, et cetera. So we'll go right along into outliers, and then we're going to double back into uh, DNS, multi-class, et cetera. All right. Outlier detection. So this is going to rely on stacking, which we already did, and build up some interesting things with key artifacts, such as user agent strings, which are found in Bro and your HTTP log. So we're going to pull it out and then do the value counts, which Pandas makes really easy. Looking at the head just gives you the top five of them. And you can see here that Mozilla dominate, the Mozilla user agent strings that we expect to see dominate the top five pretty heavily. All right, and then as we look at the tail instead, we see this interesting artifact here, the so sorry.ca and then a drop off to all these things. This is actually out of a cyber defense exercise, so you see like the Air Force.mil in there because of it's simulating a DOD environment. And this is interesting and we're gonna wanna drill into it. So we drill into it. And if we look at it, we see that it's mostly gets and very few posts, which is interesting to see. And then we're gonna go to the next step. And so <clears throat> mostly consuming traffic, very little producing traffic. Um, could be some, the domain itself is suspicious. We found it because of the user agent string and we wanna continue digging into that in the future. That brings us into consistency analysis and illegal artifacts. So, why did I, I apologize, enrichment shouldn't have gotten into that one, which I will jump up to in a different slide. All right. Going over to measures of entropy and randomness though, we can look into DNS using either nonces, which as you guys are familiar with, C2 traffic over DNS relies on communicating all the way through the recursive DNS structures, all the way to the authoritative name server. In order to do that, you have to not only minimize caching uh, or cache time values, but you also have to consistently create a unique subdomain that forces the DNS servers to talk all the way back to the authoritative name server for that domain. So we're gonna look for nonces because you're going to see a lot of nonces when C2 is being done or tunneling is being done over DNS. So we've gone through in this code and we're actually gonna break out everything uh, that's below level three. That's based on some experience on, on Ben's part. Most of the nonces are gonna be at level four or lower. So you've got your top level domain, your .com, your .co.uk's, and then you've got your primary domain then typically one subdomain and then nonces is what he's mostly had experience seeing. So when we rip it out that way, we can then count things by those level threes and we immediately see that cybermugging.net has, what is that, 376,000 children at level four. And then we also see shark lasers, which has a similar level three to cybermugging.net, has the same thing. We see legitimate domains that behave like illegitimate domains uh, and that's because a lot of legitimate domains collect telemetry on you using the same process as malware does. So actually what you'll see in a real network is your AVs will pop up when you do this stuff the same way that your malware C2 will pop up, which is always fun. Alternatively, we can calculate the probability of the lowest subdomain and we can look at its entropy. Shout out to Mark Baggett who's in the room somewhere for uh, the code that we stole from his GitHub. And then we can aggregate probability of subdomains um, by the last three levels. And this, we can then sort on and start identifying interesting things to look at. So interesting ones jump out, cyberbattlefield.com, cyber mugging, and shark lasers is in there again somewhere. Finally, we can use um, essentially the same thing as counting the number of, uh, grouping it by the level three and then counting its, uh, the number of times it occurs is we can calculate an out degree based on looking at this as a tree, and we'll show you an alternative way of looking at this at the very end when we talk set intersections. 
So again, the level threes cause us to drill, their number of children, which is indicated by optic degree, causes us to drill in on things that are suspicious. Lenovo pops up again, and other things as well. Finally, unregistered. This one's fun. So there are a, there are a set amount of pre-registered HTTP methods, and we can go to IANA, and we can pull them down and say, what are they? And then we can very easily go to the HTTP log, look at the HTTP method, and be like, if it's not in this list, filter it out. So we're gonna start by stacking it as normal. We see that git dominates the equation, uh, followed shortly by post, and we expect to see that because we've all read uh, a TCP stream for an HTTP connection in Wireshark. And then we continue reading down, and we're less familiar with these. Pretty sure that's not in the IANA uh, definition. But may, maybe these are, we'll go back and double check it. And then we get down, we're like, Nessus? That's a, that's a phone scanner. That's not an HTTP method. And so this starts to jump out very, very quickly. So go through and sort it out based on the uh, exclamation point star. And we're starting to zero in onto weird traffic that way. Go ahead and build it out. Pull it down on prop find, also starts indicating uh, malicious IPs, and we should see an overlap between, if we were to go back and resolve shark lasers and cyber mugging, we'll see an overlap between their, the IPs in the um, DNS table and what we're looking at in con right now. Finally, we can mush this all together and hunt based on that. So we have across the top the method, the number of times that an originating host used that method, and we can see again that you know, head get and post are gonna dominate this and then we're gonna have some weird outliers in the end. Sorry, mouse, okay. All right, back in traffic artifacts, looking at methods. All right, consistency analysis. So this is when we start getting into a little more of the heavy data science. So look across, we can build what's called a consistency table, which is gonna give us an idea uh, almost essentially the same thing as a pivot table for those familiar with Excel. We can walk across it and see very, very quickly a summary of the data of how things like, um, so sorry, how many times is it connected, get, post, et cetera, and then we can calculate a ratio very quickly uh, with this at the same time. So we can see so sorry jumps again. And then we have a hammer doc, a IP address without a domain name, and then MTG, which in my head is Magic the Gathering, but it's probably meeting.com or something. Legal artifacts we already talked through, and then we get to the fun part, enrichment. So for enrichment, it's important to realize there are a whole lot of free data sources out there um, that can get you really far where you wanna go. We wanna show you two today and talk through a couple other ones. We're gonna talk about publicly available Whois. There are a lot of Whois services that have RESTful APIs that you can query. APNIC is one of them. APNIC queries others, so it's a really reliable one to use. Uh, and then Showdown, of course, everyone's heard of. VirusTotal also has an API. You can get a free version. And then uh, you can also look at things like emerging threats and pull down rules and enrichment from there as well with a little bit of creativity. Some of these, like Shodan, which uh, uh, have an API library, so we'll start with pandas and Shodan, uh, and then we'll use the request library to actually go through, and for every IP that we've observed, we can then pull down its name, country, starting address, ending address, and some entries have an org name. Um, that's not as consistent in who is information, but a lot of times your network name, which is the name field, will imply an organizational name, and the street address will as well. So then we can actually pull this into a data frame and look at it that way. And if we wanted to, we could then go back and stack by, if we thought the country was actually a good indicator, which it's not, um, we could look that way. So let me rephrase that. Country is a good indicator when your traffic consistently comes from a well-defined region. If I have a web server in Texas that only gets traffic from Texas normally, and then suddenly Florida man hits me, that's weird. Most web servers don't have that easy use case though. Most web servers have traffic from all over the world and so geographic location doesn't really matter. We also know that APTs and script kitties don't always come from their home. So if I'm concerned about Chinese hacker or Russian hacker and I see a Russian IP, 
that doesn't actually imply that that IP is in Russia. We all know how easy it is to spoof that, as well as how to route through something for free to anonymize it, such as Tor, or you name the man in the middle as a service that you want to purchase for your VPN. Shodan, uh, Shodan has a rate limit for your $5 version that you can buy once a year. Um, so we'll show you what some of the results look like, but you can, on the version I have, you can only make 500 requests a month, which is a little inconvenient for this. So if I run for information on Quad Ones, which is Cloudflare, I get back really rich information in JSON, preformatted in JSON. I'm actually gonna get a list of matches to that IP, and then the second field in this will actually be a field that describes the number of matches I got. And then you can see in here that I also have product information, so it's running an Apache server, you get versions from it without having to interact with it, and then the juicy stuff, which is all the bones. So this helps me understand as I'm enriching the things that my environment is talking to, if I'm talking to something on port 80 and then I pull information back from Shodan and it hasn't seen something on port 80, that's a little weird. That's almost never going to happen because Shodan doesn't get blacklisted that often. But when I start to see a mismatch between artifacts, that's how I can start to zero in on, on interesting activity. All right. Go back through and review our techniques. So I'm actually going to jump to one last experimental one. So we talk about down here at the very bottom set operations and how they can provide us really simple things. We can also learn a lot from network statistics. So we'll show you some of the work that we did at the very, very end. It's still a little rough. All right, so going back to pandas, in this case, in this example, we're gonna use a library called NetworkX. For those who have ever done graph theory with Python, you know of NetworkX because it's your best friend. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna stack our DNS queries again. This is from a different data set than the one with shark lasers. Uh, and we, if we look at the bottom 15, we can see all these interesting ones, uh, including Bing, which I'm kind of glad is at the bottom of this. Um, and then some weird, like poorly defined Facebook stuff and whatnot. But this isn't really telling me what I want to know without having to go back and start to Google individual ones. So instead, we're going to turn it into a graph or a tree by basically going through every query. And I'm going to split every query into its, from its top level domain all the way down to its last subdomain. I'm gonna split it and I'm gonna turn that into one trace through a tree and I'm gonna do that multiple times. I'm gonna keep track of the, of the level that we saw that word at. So if I see Google at level one and then I see it again at level five, that's interesting when I re-evaluate my data because Google should like never show up at level five if it's legitimate. Then network X lets me run one command to calculate out degree across all nodes in my network. It actually is pretty fast. And then I can stack it based on that. What I've done here Actually, this is the next slide. So this shows us nothing. When I stack it this way, I immediately see that co at level one, which is probably a co.uk, is dominating most of my queries, and then Google at level one is as well. So what I want to do then is go back through and take out all of the level zeros that I know about and all of the effective level zeros that I know about so that I can actually get towards something that may have a nonce later down in the chain. Once I do that and relook at it, I then have stuff that I can actually look into. So Co somehow didn't get scraped out. Actually, that's the problem. I'm gonna do it this way. We are having a visuals problem, so we're gonna fix it this way. So I run through and I prune it, and then I can come up here, rerun my out degree calculation, and visualize it. And then we can see co is still in there. Dot com at level zero goes away, but I've got a com at level one. And then Google, if I was to have this in an actual responsive graph, I would see that Google at level three, or sorry, at level two has 46 subdomains. Uh, and so I can then repeat this process, go through here and say, okay, I know that google.com has a lot of children. And prune that out and then look for the next thing until I start to see something below level one and zero that has a lot of children. And this is one of my ways that I can detect my nonces that aren't sitting at level four like our previous technique was relying on. All right, just kill this. 
then finally we can use set intersections to do some really interesting things. There's a concept called orphan flows, which is a communication to an IP that wasn't preceded by a DNS lookup. Anything crossing your boundary is most likely going to have a DNS lookup before it has an IP communication, or sorry, a TCP communication following it. So very, very simply, we're gonna pull out our unique destinations and our unique, uh, yeah, our unique answers from our DNS log. So basically, I've made a DNS request, I got an answer back, I'm gonna compare that to my destinations. So things I actually went to, a set of things I actually went to, minus the set, so the set difference, of things that I requested, and that gives me a list of orphan sessions, and without displaying all of them, in this data set, I have 756 net flows out of my network that were not preceded by DNS. And that's a lot of stuff to go through. Ideally, this should not be happening in your network as much as this. This is PCAP for a malware run, so it's a little abnormal. And you'd need to dig through all of that because a lot of low-hanging fruit C2 exist in this, uh, in this orphaned section. Alternatively, I can look for DNS that's not followed up by a TCP request, which is also interesting because that might show me DNS C2. So again, with a simple set intersection, a little bit of creativity with Venn diagrams, I can be like, okay, let me look at all of the IPs that I got in response and then see which ones I got in response that I didn't then go dig into. And in this case, I have 2,770. This, this particular technique requires a little more pruning uh, to dial in on something truly useful because if you've ever studied DNS traffic, you'll see that sometimes you get four or five IPs back with one request, and you need to then go through that and find, did this request generate a response? But off the cuff, we can already start addressing that problem with a very, very simple math calculation that takes us a long way towards understanding what's going on. All right, so in conclusion, we've got aggregation, summary statistics across the network, understanding mean, mode, median. Uh, visualization, caution on visualization, you should never go there first unless you're doing a presentation because your visuals are going to distract your understanding of the numbers. It creates the anchoring bias based on big shiny pictures and you may not actually see the significant, whereas the numbers are less inclined to do that to you, especially if you're looking, them, uh, with dis looking at them with descriptive statistics. And then enrichment, add data to it. Uh, we showed you Shodan and APNIC in this case. Would encourage you to look at emerging threats as well. And then processing, transforming it into different forms so that we can learn more. And then finally, learning analytics, which we don't demonstrate at all in this, this presentation. Some insights and future work. So again, don't go complex when simple will work. Almost everything in here with a little bit of, of creativity and a couple coffees with Bryant Treckle would turn into a dashboard if you wanted it to. Um, you don't necessarily need a random forest to make a decision, some, some unguided decision on your network to tell you this is bad when you can just stack a, a couple things compared to some thread intel and be this is bad right here. If you wanna get after things that are uniquely signatured and are complex to chase after, you have to lock down the simple first or threats will ride through the simple while you're busy looking for them in the complex. Be careful applying machine learning, we beat that one to death. Don't go down visualizations unless you can manage it. Um, yeah, numbers don't lie, they're also easier to compress, visuals take up lots of space. And then finally, on any data science discussion when it comes to overlapping with security, we have to talk about something called base rate fallacy. For those statisticians in the room, you're familiar with the concept of base rate fallacy and how it basically tells me that when I look at the number that says that I only have a 0.1% false positive rate, that's misleading because I anchor to the 0.1, but when I have a list of positives that's 1 million long, that turns into, let's see, that's what, 100 times, 10, 10 100 times, uh, that's substantially longer than any of my analysts can actually get through in a single day. So we really, when it comes to data science and computer security, we want to be shooting for a false positive rate of zero because your point ones and your point fives turn into massive lists that your SOC analysts have to triage in a given time. Future work, we wanna migrate the code into, uh, from its private repo into a public repo, organize it a little bit better than it is in this presentation, and we've got a lot to do within our arrival time. And we've just summarized, so I'm actually coming in a little ahead of time based on what I thought, and we'll open it up for questions at this point.
Yes, so all of the code in the repo has been done in notebooks. So when we post the repo, you'll get all of the notebooks, all of the documentation with it. We've got to scrub it for a couple things like my Shodan API key before we push it up. Um, yeah, right, best practices. I, I work in computer security, I know better. Um, so everything will be in notebooks and you'll have the version of the presentation which you can visualize as well as all of the, the little notebooks to walk you through the analysis. So. Yes, sir. What's the about version it's free. It's free. That's, that's my primary thing that I like about it. It's free and it's useful and with a little bit of tuning it can be really useful. That was emerging threats. We're talking emerging threats. Okay, cool.